All right, we're in Mark uh, chapter 10. And we, uh, <clears throat> we looked at this uh, section rather quickly uh, last time, so, but we're going to go back over it in a little more detail this time. It's uh, beginning in verse 23. We may get all the way to 31, but for sure we want to get through 23 to 27. So let me read. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Jesus has been teaching on the entrance into his kingdom. He has used uh, two very powerful illustrations. One, the illustration of a small child, saying that you have to enter as a child. And then now he's used a rich, young, prominent, um, a Jewish ruler <clears throat> who has come to him asking what one more thing must I do to have eternal life. Jesus has taken two people, two illustrations. One that the crowd and the disciples would look at and say this one clearly isn't qualified. This one is a baby, a child, hasn't done anything to merit the kingdom of God. So clearly that little child would have a problem. And then the second one, the rich young ruler, an observant Jew, a wealthy man, a prominent man, and a good man, he clearly in their mind would have been one who was in. I mean, clearly God has blessed this young man and, and blessed him with wealth particularly. And that's a sign that God loves this man and he obviously will be in the kingdom of God. But Jesus has, in a sense, confounded them because he has said it is the child who will enter. And this rich, wealthy, prominent, observant Jewish man went away. Went away and did not find the answer to his question. And then he says, Jesus says, the young man left, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And then in verse 24, he says, how hard it is for those who trust in those riches to enter the kingdom of God. And in fact, it isn't hard, Jesus says, it's impossible. It's impossible. That's essentially what he says. It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Camels don't get through eyes of needle. And, and just so you don't, don't get confused over his illustration, he clearly says what he means next. Where he says in verse 27, but when, the, when the disciples themselves respond, well, then who can be saved? And he says, well, no one can in verse 27. With men it is what? Impossible. It is impossible. There's nothing men can do to enter the kingdom of God. But with God, all things are possible. There is nothing a man can do or a woman can do to enter into God's kingdom. But it is possible with God. It is possible, but it is difficult. Go with me to Matthew. Chapter 7 and verse 13. Jesus, again, speaking about entering into the kingdom of God. Who is going to enter into the kingdom of God and who is not going to enter into the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it. 
most go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. The picture is uh, a broad road with many people on it and over here on the side there's a little narrow road and in front of it is a narrow gate and literally if you read through the rest of this section in front of that narrow gate there are a bunch of false teachers pointing the crowds down the broad road the broad road to heaven which in fact is leading to hell that narrow gate difficult to see and difficult to enter. Difficult to see because what is the narrow gate? Why, it's Jesus. He's the gate. And people don't see him. And they don't want to see him. And it's a difficult way because Jesus says, it's the only way. And Jesus says, you come to me and through this gate without any baggage. You don't come through with your parents. You don't come through with your church members. You don't come through with your religion. You don't come through with your goodness. You don't come through with anything. It's like a very narrow turnstile. You come to me and only you come through if you come to me. If you come by trusting in me. If you see me, believe in me, believe in the work I did on the cross for your sins, see your sin, desire me more than anything in this world or any of the sin that you so love, only then, crying out for mercy, coming as a child in need, only then can you find the gate and enter through the gate. But, I will do it. If you desire to come, I will bring you. Because, what does John 14 say? John 14, verse 6. Very familiar scripture. Jesus says, I am the way. Way what? With a way to where? Or the way to heaven? They're asking where he's going. And he's saying, you can't come now, but I will come for you. And well, we don't know the way. Don't worry. I'm the way. Find me, and you find the narrow gate. Find the narrow gate, come with me, and I'll take you to heaven. I am the way, and I am the truth about heaven, and I am the truth about the way to heaven, and I am the life that you will have when you come to me, when you enter into the spiritual life I offer, which is eternal, and heaven is the end result of that. So I'll bring you. But coming back to Mark, it is impossible for man. That, that is such an... Uh, that's such an offensive statement to man. If you've ever shared the gospel with people, you've seen that. People get offended. Offended that there's only one way. Offended that Jesus is the only way. I mean, who do you think you are? I mean, my God isn't that exclusive. My God is loving and open. Yes, your God is at the end of the broad road, and it is Lucifer. He is a liar, and he is a deceiver. So that's the principal lesson that Jesus has been teaching in these last few verses that we've been looking at. And that is, what are the qualifications to have eternal life, to, to enter into the kingdom of God? And those qualifications, you've got to be like a child. You must come needy, helpless, for mercy. And there's nothing that you can do as a human to qualify. God does not recognize your goodness. God does not recognize your religion, how, how many of the ceremonies you judiciously kept, how many times you went to church, how many Bible studies you attended. That has nothing to do with whether or not you're going to enter into the kingdom of God. It's impossible for you to figure it out, to be good enough. 
But praise God, with God all things are possible. With Jesus all things are possible. Come to me. In some sense, and there's a secondary lesson in the middle of the primary lesson. The primary lesson is clearly about the kingdom of God, but there is something else that Jesus teaches here, and it's worthy of our attention and worthy to spend some time in. Because he's teaching about the dangers of wealth. He's teaching about the dangers of wealth. Now remember, we talked about the fact that the Jewish perspective was wealth was a blessing from God. Their conclusion, therefore, was that a wealthy person would be favored by God and ultimately favored with eternal life and heaven. And the, and the disciples and the Jewish people were not totally wrong in this, right? I mean, the blessing and wealth, or wealth and money is a blessing from God. I mean, it's one of those things. Go with me to James chapter 1, 17, 1 verse 17. James says, uh, every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. He is perfect in all respects. He is sovereign in all respects. And he grants both by his common grace to all people and by his special grace in his son and in the salvation he offers, he brings goodness to people. And one of the things he can bring to you from a temporal standpoint, sometimes unsaved and sometimes saved, he will bring to you wealth, resources. So when, when the Jewish people think that money is a blessing from God, it is. It is. It has nothing to do with your eternal state. It has nothing to do with your relationship with him. But it is a blessing. In addition to that, it is a, it is a blessing that has no uh, inherent moral uh, effect. It has it, it, In it, there is no inherent evil or there is no inherent good in money. It is just stuff. That's all. Some people get a lot of stuff. Some people don't get so much stuff. But it is, though, and, and mark this, it is, like all of God's good gifts, something that sinful man can pervert. And somebody said one time, all sin is, in a sense, the perversion of the good gifts of God. I haven't contemplated or thought on that long enough, but it sounds good to me. S seems right. All his good gifts can be abused. All his good gifts can be perverted. And rather than be a blessing, it can, in a very real sense, become a barrier to salvation for those who have it outside of the grace of God. That wealth, rather than being something that is given to them by God for his good purposes and for them to see his blessing on them, it can rather become a barrier. That's what happened to the rich young ruler. Right? That's what happened to him. That's, a, that's the test that Jesus gave him. The test to expose his heart. Go and sell it. Follow me. And he left. That rich young ruler, he was a perfect target of an evangelist. I mean, this was a nice guy. This was a successful guy. I mean, think of the influence this guy could have had if he would have come to Jesus. This guy was a religious guy. He, he kept the religion the best he could. Moral, he tried to keep the commandments. Observant, nice guy. And he knew he had a major problem. He knew that he wasn't right with God. I think in the sense of it, he knew he wasn't forgiven. There was something in him. There was something in him that said, I just, I'm not right. If I die today, I'm not going to be right. And I, I've tried everything I'm supposed to do in my religion. So there must just be one more thing I'm missing. And that's what he was asking for. Just one more thing. And Jesus was saying, hey, it's bigger than one thing. 
but I'll give you one test to show you the problem. Go sell your stuff. Go sell your stuff. You see, for the rich young ruler, and for many people who have money and wealth, that wealth and that money has replaced God or is an obstacle to reaching the one true God. It is, uh, in a very real sense, an idol that you are unwilling to give up. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, And verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Money, like a number of things, but money maybe particularly, can become an idol. It makes you a spiritual adulterer. It keeps you from God if you are unsaved, and it destroys your ministry, your testimony, your joy if you allow it into that place as a saved person. So the question is, is, is money an idol for you? How would you test yourself? Well, what, what would you look at to try to determine that? Well, I, I just came up with a few questions. Take out your pencil. No. <laughs> Here's the question. Um, what do you look to for your security? When you strip it all away, where is your trust? Where is your trust? If your bank account starts going down, does your faith start to go with it? Does your anxiety go up? Do you begin to worry? What do you trust in? Do you trust in the things of this world? Or do you trust in the God who made this world? What do you trust in? Where is your security? How about this one? What is it that provides your identity? What do you boast in? I thought it was interesting in the sermon today because Dan does um, did what I, what I was thinking about talking about as well. Is he when when you're in a, an environment with a group of people, people that you don't know, and you're introduced to somebody, and and somebody asks you, "What do you do? What do you tell them? Or or who are you? Or?" What is, your, what is the definition of who you are? And he's right. Almost all the time, and in my case as well, somebody will ask the question, what do you do? In other words, what is your profession? Or what was your profession? Or what, what did you do in your life that was most important? How many times have you ever heard somebody say, I'm a Christian? <laughs> I boast in Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is my identity. Jesus is, is my life. Now, there, there were things I, I did to make money in this world. There were places, different jobs I've had, just different positions, but they don't identify me. Whether I was good at it, successful at it, or not makes no real difference at all. It is important that I was faithful at it, but not what the result was. The only thing that's really important is that you know that I love Jesus and I want to tell you about him. 
because no matter what your profession is, no matter how much money you've got, no matter what your station in life is, you need Jesus. Where do you get your security? What do you trust in? Who provides your identity? And then, who gets your time? Who gets your energy? How much time do you spend in the things of the world, in this particular case, in pursuing money? Now, for some of us, we're past the pursuit of money stage. I mean, many of us are in retirement in some form or another, so that isn't as big a thing for us as it would have been some years ago. But it's still an issue. I mean, how much time do you spend pursuing money or keeping the money you have versus spending time with Jesus? And that doesn't mean you have to uh, be in prayer 24 hours a day. It's just a case of, am I living my life in the presence of the Lord? Do I, do I wake up in the morning thinking about Him? Do I enter into new relationships with people thinking about Him and, and the providential meeting that I have with this person and why I'm meeting them and, and what it is that Jesus would want me to do? Or, or when I'm struggling, when the, when the light turns red and I'm late, I mean, uh, do I think about the Lord's providence? and his desire to build patience in me. Do I see life and all the circumstances of it as God's providential care for me? And in that, my purpose in this day, whatever it is. And it may be, as the sermon, it may be nothing more than giving a cup of cold water to somebody. This is not looking for earth-shattering huge things. This is, do you live your life in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have a Christian perspective on your existence? Or is it the world's perspective that, that Christianity breaks into every Sunday for a while? Where do you spend your time? Where do you place your energy? What dominates your thoughts? Money? Possessions, the lack of it, the loss of them. Or the blessedness of being a child of God. Yeah, the, the ultimate question is, what, what do you love? What, what do you love? Because all of these things we've talked about will define whether you love something or not, right? How do you love Jesus, but you trust money? How do you love Jesus, but you boast in your possessions and your house and your cars and your, or your kids' possessions and your kids' cars and your kids' jobs? Or how do you love Jesus and spend all your time in earthly pursuits? How do you love Jesus if there's no way for you to evidence that in the things of your life, the way you think, the things you say, and the things you do. The rich young ruler was a man convicted. Something was wrong. But his wealth was his idol. And no matter how great that desire in him was, that desire to be right with God, it wasn't great enough to break through his idolatry. His idol had a hold on his heart. It was too strong for him. He trusted it too much. It was his identity. And when asked to give it up, to follow the one true God through the narrow gate, it was too hard. It was just too hard. And there's another guy it's an interesting example. Go with me to Luke chapter 12. <coughs> Familiar man. Beginning in verse uh, 16, Jesus spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. 
And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barn. Very interesting thing. He didn't just build more barns on his open land. He, that would have that would have restricted his amount of, to make money. He could make the most money if he just built three-story barns or anyway. What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and not treasure toward God. This guy was devoted to the same idol. His idol was money, crops, and he was good at it. He was good at serving his idol. And his idol made him very confident. That's where he got his security. That's where he put his trust. That's where all of his energy went. That's where his thoughts were dominated. But you know what happens? Idols always fail you. Idols always fail you. And in both of these examples, the failure is catastrophic because those idols will take you to an eternal hell. That's why Jesus was sad for the young man. That's why the scripture says this farmer is a fool. Because you've allowed this temporal idol, which is a lie, to keep you from the kingdom of God. God says, don't trust this idol. Instead, in Matthew 6.19... The Lord says in his amazing Sermon on the Mount, he says, um, sorry, Matthew 6, 19. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and the thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. <coughs> it's interesting, isn't it? He's, he's saying your heart follows your treasure. <laughs> your heart will be right if your treasure is right. If you're focused in the right place, your heart will follow. Lay up treasures in heaven. What is that? Well, just uh, seek what's really valuable. Not the stuff that, that, that rusts and rots and is stolen and is temporary. <coughs> seek the stuff that's eternal. The, the things that are of, of true value. Listen, here it is. You want to know what they are? Seek the things that glorify your God in heaven. Seek the things that glorify Him. Spend, spend a little time in the Scripture looking at what it is that glorifies Him so that you can live your life seeking to glorify Him so that you can store up eternal treasures. Find your security, your identity, your purpose, your joy with Him. 
Now, storing up treasure in heaven does not mean that we don't work here on earth. When it's our time in our lives to work, we need to work. And in fact, we need to still be working as Christians in the kingdom of God and for the kingdom of God. But, but Jesus isn't saying to the younger people, just mm, sit around and pray and don't do anything. In Ephesians, go to Ephesians chapter 6. He says, uh, verse 5 and 6, he says, bond servants, that's us, slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. What is this? It's, it's your responsibilities in the workplace. You're supposed to work. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. So one of the ways that you glorify God is to do the job that God has given you to do to provide for your family in a manner that indicates that you're working for the Lord Jesus Christ. You are honest, you are faithful, you are trustworthy in the workplace. That's a way to glorify God. And Second Thessalonians 3.10 says, if you don't work, and provide for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. So all of us have that responsibility during the years of our life. So we are called, we are called to be responsible in this life for the temporal things that this life requires, recognizing that we can only do them correctly if we do them to the Lord and for His glory. We are to work in this world as we serve our God in his kingdom, as we pray and worship and exhibit the love and the kindness that he calls us to, even to enemies. We are called to share him and lift him up and represent him in this world. And with all that said, we are to do something else. In First Timothy, First Timothy chapter six. Paul says to Timothy, beginning in uh, verse six. Now godliness with what's the next word? Contentment. Contentment is great gain. For I brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that I will carry, or we will carry nothing out. <clears throat> he goes on to say, And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptations and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We are to live in this life being content, being faithful to do what he calls us to do, and being content. How much worry could you do away with if you were content? And recognizing that worry is sin, how much sin could you do away with if you were content? What does it take to be content? Not pursue the things that the world say you must have to be content. And that's principally money. Not only money, but principally money. Could be fame, could be power, could be position. But the world says you need these things in order to be self-fulfilled, in order to be content, in order to be all you can be, in order to be happy. And God says, uh, those all are a lie. There's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves, but when they capture your heart, they become your idol. They're going to open you up to all kinds of trouble and sin. Because the love of money is the root of all kinds of sin and evil. So don't don't 
let that happen. Don't love money and possessions like the world tells you to, but be content. Now, it isn't just that God says, be content in a vacuum. I mean, just, you know, go home, sit in the corner and keep saying the word content. I'm content. I'm, I know I'm content. I'm content. I'll be, I'm content. No, no, no. That isn't how you do it. That's not how you do it. How do you do it? Well, you trust your God. And you trust what He says. Now, He says that He is sovereign over all things. That includes even the troubles you're in. He says that. He also says that He loves you, and He's proved it by sending His Son to die for you. He also says that He works all things together for your good. And he also says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, and knowing that these tests produce patience in you. They change you. So the circumstances of this life that are, that are hard, that are difficult, that are trials, are no less under the control of God. He has a purpose in them, and your contentment has to be in your trusting Him for those things that He says about the issues that are worrying you and troubling you. Contentment comes to those who have a very big God, a very loving God, and a very sovereign God in the simple, ordinary issues and trials of your life. Those people trust that God and can be content when the world can never be content, and even Christians who unfortunately have too small a God cannot be content. Pursue the one true God and live that peaceful, blessed life. Not without trouble, but always with Him to bring you through that trouble, working out His good purpose in it. Pursue the idol of money and reap destruction. And we could say this about any idol, but since money is the focus of this text, look, for the love of money, for the love of the idol of money, people lie and they cheat and they steal and they embezzle and they threaten and they accost and they abuse and they abduct and they murder. And on and on and on. For the love of money, they are jealous, they are envious, they slander people and they defame people. And on and on and on. For the love of money, marriages are lost, friendships are lost, family is lost, jobs are lost, reputation is lost, ministry is lost, and even lives are lost. In 1 Timothy, Timothy says, and some have been pierced through with many sorrows and departed from the faith. Not that they lost their salvation, but money has exposed their false faith and they are gone. Gone from the blessedness of even being around Christians. Don't let money become an idol. Listen, whether you have it or whether you don't have it. It can be just as big an idol for people that don't have money as it can be for those that do have money. Because all of those things that we laid out that marked idolatry, they happen in the pursuit of money and they per happen in the people who have it and try to keep it. Money can dominate you from a place of wealth or a place of poverty, either way. If you don't have money, be content. Rejoice in the spiritual riches that you have. 
the blessedness of eternal life. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies belong to you in Christ. Rejoice in it. If you have it, stay humble. Don't go thinking you're something when you're nothing just because you may have money. And use it for His glory. Don't love it. Don't trust it. Money, one final thought. Money is a barometer for your soul. There's no evil in it. There's no good in it. It's just a measuring stick. How is your soul doing? Is it wholly committed to the one who provided it to you? Or has it replaced him? Has it replaced it? Is it becoming an idol because it has too much priority in your life? Or do you rightly see it for what it is? And listen, I believe this battle with this idol is not fought once and then it's over. I think it has the potential to always come at you in different forms and shapes and times. And always call you to ask yourself, who is my God? Whom do I trust? Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for this uh, lesson on the dangers of wealth, Lord. Blessings from you that can cause great harm. If our attitudes are wrong about it, if we allow it to become a, a replacement for you, Lord, a substitute for you, and God help us, Lord, don't let that ever happen in our lives. If we have it, help us to use it for your glory, but never trust it or love it. If we don't have it, help us not to bemoan that fact, but rejoice in what we do have, which is far more valuable, all the spiritual riches that we possess in you, Jesus. We are, uh, we are your children. You promised to care for us. We know you will. And give us great wisdom in how we are to live in a lost world, Father, in the midst of all of the debauchery and sin. Help us to be the lights that you call us to be. We can't do that if our affections are placed on money. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.